Okay, everyone, I've got the top of the hour on my clock, so I'm going to get started. Uh, so welcome everybody. I hope you're having a good Tuesday so far. Um, and thank you for joining me for today's presentation. Um, and it's gonna be about reducing your stormwater infrastructure using uh, grass and gravel pavements. So I'm your host, Sam Justice, and I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of Wisconsin with degrees in civil and geotechnical engineering. I'm one of the engineers here at Presto Geosystems, and we manufacture erosion control, stormwater management, and porous pavement products. So we are located in Northern Wisconsin, which is where most of our products are made. And then we work all over the US and the world on a wide variety of projects uh, using any number of these products. So some learning objectives for today. Uh, so we're gonna start with understanding the benefits of using a porous pavement system and how both rigid and flexible systems can perform under varying traffic loading conditions. We're gonna talk about both aggregate surface and vegetated or grassed surface for porous pavements and why you may choose one over the other. And finally, we're gonna get into how some of the porous pavements are capable of detaining stormwater runoff and helping achieve green building goals on your project site. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them in your questions tab in the GoToWebinar uh, file. Um, and I'm gonna to get to them at the end of the presentation. So first, a little bit of background about Presto Geosystems. So we worked with the US Army Corps of Engineers to develop the GeoCell technology, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, um, in the late 1970s. And we've been innovating in this market ever since. Our products have been used in over 200 countries and in every state in the United States. And we go beyond simply providing a product. We're helping you provide a complete solution for your project needs. So we operate in three main product areas, soil stabilization using our GeoWeb GeoCells. Those can be used for load support, slope and channel protection, and constructing green retaining walls. Then also porous pavements, which uh, we have both a vegetated and an aggregate solution and then also lightweight and reusable construction mats. So that's a lot of different stuff. And today we're gonna to focus on reducing your stormwater infrastructure with grass and gravel porous pavements. If you uh, would like any information on any of the other uh, topics um, or any of our other uh, products that we're not gonna talk about today, um, you can go to our website at prestogeo.com or email us directly and we're more than happy to talk about those as well. Um, just not. Uh, for today's webinar. Okay, so now moving on to our focus, which is gonna be that porous pavement. Um, so the natural first question is, why are porous pavements needed and how are they gonna be different than the standard pavement surfaces we usually see? And there are gonna be a number of benefits to using a porous pavement over a standard hard surface, porous, hard surface pavement for your project. So porous pavements are a class of solution that address in a cost-effective way, regulations that need to be met for your project site. After 40 plus years, the Clean Water Act con continues to create the need for stormwater management for both quantity and quality. And most states have also developed non-point pollution regulations with spe specific targets that need to be met. And local regulations may require even more stringent standards if your project site is near a protected wetland or water source. Using porous pavements is one way to meet these different criteria while still performing in a structurally meaningful and long lasting way. So another reason to choose porous pavements is that it's gonna be the best option for your project site. Many locations have poor soil conditions and because a lot of the better suited sites have become more scarce over time. Uh, land is at a premium. Sometimes it's hard to find new project sites and new locations. So you have to settle for those poor soil uh, sites. And you can also have things like high stormwater management value, which is gonna be the desire to make the best use of valuable high cost land and reduce the need for stormwater ponds by increasing the porosity of your pavement. 
So porous pavements handle stormwater at the point of impact, percolating water where it falls and avoiding the need for conveyance pipes and other types of structures that might otherwise be necessary. And sustainable solutions are really popular with the public right now. Um, and all of our products at Presto Geosystems are made with a high percentage of recycled materials, which is gonna reduce landfilling and have the ability to achieve green building credits. So there are a couple different types of porous pavement options that you can choose from for your project. The first is gonna be the more traditional and probably the more well-known option for porous pavements. And that's gonna to be to use the pervious version of traditional pavements. So that's gonna be porous concrete, porous asphalt, and paver blocks. So these applications allow for normal traffic frequency use, and they do have increased infiltration over their non-porous versions. So that can help with your stormwater requirements. And hard surface por porous pavements, they act very similarly to their traditional counterparts, um, but they do tend to suffer from some long-term durability challenges. So just something to keep in mind. Gonna, the biggest difference between a standard pavement and the hard surface porous version of that pavement is gonna be in the cross section below the surface. All three of these methods are gonna require deeper cross sections than the standard pavement, and they require something called a choker or a bedding course. And that's gonna be between the pavement surface and your open graded base layer. So this choker layer is intended to be both the leveling surface for your pavement, ensuring a smooth and properly built surface. And it's also intended to provide the resistance to movement or differential settlement that's required to prevent damage to the surface. So it definitely has an important function, but it can be costly and time consuming to install properly. And I did say that there were some durability challenges um, and there's a couple other uh, pretty significant drawbacks to using these, you know, quote unquote, traditional porous pavement methods. Um, so cost is gonna be one of the biggest factors and that's cost both during installation and over the lifetime of the project. During construction, these type of products need specialized materials to create the porous pavement and specially trained contractors that know how to properly install this type of system. And there's gonna be a lot of long-term maintenance requirements as well. So you need things like regular deep cleaning, like vacuuming um, and power washing to reduce clogged areas. Um, and that's gonna happen in your high traffic areas, like your drive lanes. Um, you need to do that to make sure there's still uh, the ability for water infiltration. And then you're also gonna to have to do a lot of resurfacing or rep replacement of lost materials due to raveling. And that occurs because there are some weak bonds between the material. And so that's how they get their, their you know, perviousness is they have those weaker bonds, which allows the water to flow through. But those weaker bonds then mean you're gonna have some of that durability issue. Um, and that choker course that we talked about, uh, while necessary for the function of the road, it actually impedes water flow. It reduces the infiltration capacity of the system and actually can lead to ponding at the surface. And that's kind of the opposite of what we're going for. Um, so definitely something to keep in mind. So obviously uh, we wanna find a way to fix these issues and have a better way moving forward. So here at Presto Geosystems, we offer two different types of porous pavement systems, a flexible and a rigid option. And both are able to fit your needs and it's just gonna be which one is gonna be a little more appropriate. Um, so instead of adaptations of existing pavements, our solutions are designed from the ground up to function as porous pavements. Uh, so let's start with uh, the rigid uh, pavement option. So there are two different surface types that can be used for our porous pavement system. I've mentioned them a couple of times. You've got topsoil with vegetation, or gravel for a stone surface. So the rigid porous pavement uh, is gonna work well with both options. So it's gonna be up to you to decide what you need on your site, whether you want grass or you want stone. Uh, the biggest difference between the two, besides the look obviously, 
is going to be the amount of vehicle traffic that they're able to withstand. With a vegetated system, vehicle traffic should only be occasional. Think just a few times a week. And that's because no matter how great the system is, grass just doesn't like to be driven on. Too much time getting crushed under vehicle tires is going to kill that grass off. So the system's still going to work, you know, no issues there, but you're not going to have that nice green lawn that you might have been hoping for. So if your pavement area is planning to see daily use, the aggregate infill, that stone, is going to be the way to go. And we tend to call ours a non-bound aggregate, and that's because we don't use any glues or resins or binders to hold the stone together. It's just the paver unit, so it has a lot of that open space between the stone to allow infiltration. Um, so there are two different paver units available depending on your infill type chosen. So the first one uh, is going to be for the vegetated system, and we call this geoblock. So the geoblock system is that rigid porous paper, um, so the panels aren't going to be able to bend or twist. Um, and this rigid nature, excuse me, um, the rigid nature means that a thinner cross section is going to be possible. And it's going to be a stronger system compared to those that are made with geotextiles, which is also an option that's out there on the market, but I really suggest you uh, try and avoid those if you can. Um, so an important aspect of the geoblock vegetated units is going to be the large amount of open space at the bottom of each cell. And you can see that in the photo. So that open space allows for full root penetration so that your grass surface is thick and uniform. So the cells are going to be filled with topsoil and then vegetated so that the grass grows above the cell walls so that you don't actually see any of the plastic material. And then the paver unit itself protects the root zone so that you're protecting that grass from the stress of vehicle tires. And then we also offer the second type, uh, which is for the aggregate system. We call this one GeoPave. So I know that those are very similar names, so I'm going to try and make sure I uh, emphasize um, the difference between the two when I say those names. Um, so the GeoPave aggregate units are going to be really similar to the GeoBlock units that we just looked at. Um, it's got those same rigid paver characteristics, but it does have a specific feature um, that's needed for the performance of an aggregate infill. And so I want to highlight it. It's going to be this mesh bottom that you see in the picture here. So this is a molded in place mesh. So it's not a separate piece that you connect. It's already built into the paper units. And so this keeps the stone from migrating underneath the units. And it helps you know, make it a little more rigid, a little bit stronger. Um, and so this uh, lattice bottom acts as kind of similar to a snowshoe. So, you know, it spreads the load out um, without causing deep ruts, um, even in high traffic zones. So your wheel loads aren't going to create those ruts. You're not going to get sunk in like drive lanes or anything. Um, and so the GeoBlock and the GeoPave units are designed specifically to work with either the GeoBlock vegetated or the GeoPave aggregate. Um, so which one you choose would be based on what surface type you're looking for. Uh, and so we also offer um, a flexible porous pavement system, and that's using our GeoWeb GeoCell. Um, so some of you may have heard of what a GeoCell is before, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about it in just a second if you haven't. Um, but a flexible porous pavement can often support the same loads as the rigid pavers we just looked at, but they are going to have a deeper cross section to carry those heavier vehicles. Um, but you might want to choose the flexible system of the GeoWeb panels um, if you know that your area has the potential for settlement. Um, so if you're in, say, like a wetland area where you know that you're going to have a little bit of sinking just due to the soil type, having the flexible panels might be um, the way to go just to help uh, mitigate potential issues long-term. So um, the GeoWeb system, it's gonna be pretty similar to um, the rigid systems we had just looked at um, in that it's gonna hold and confine your material so you still get that good drivable surface. Um, 
But the main difference between the GeoWeb flexible system and either the GeoBlock vegetated system or the GeoPave aggregate system, which are the rigid panels, um, is that with the rigid panels, you're driving directly on those paver units. While with the flexible system, with the GeoWeb panels, you're driving on the infill material. So it's much more important to choose a high quality material when implementing the flexible system. You obviously aren't gonna get the ruts from the rigid paver units, but you're not gonna get them here either. Uh, the GeoWeb panels do create a platform, or we call it sometimes the mattress effect, um, but this allows for the vehicles to drive over this area without causing ruts. Um, you're not gonna get wheel wells, sunken drive lanes, anything like that. So you don't have to worry about that if you choose the flexible system. Um, so just a little bit about what the GeoWeb panels are, um, in case people aren't familiar with what a GeoCell is. Um, but it has basically two main attributes. The first is gonna be the cell or the container size. Um, and so these come in three diameters, small, medium, and large, and then cell heights of three, four, six, eight, and 12 inches. Um, so the dimensions that you would choose for the GeoWeb panels are going to depend really strongly on what your project details are, what your vehicle lo re loading requirements are, what your subsoil looks like, all of that stuff. So that's something that um, myself and the rest of the team here at Presto Geosystems can help you determine is which is going to be the most appropriate for your specific job. Um, and then something else that I want to point out is going to be the ultrasonically welded seam. Um, and so that's where all of these connecting points are. Um, and so the stronger the seam, the better the performance of the geocell will be. Um, a strong seam allows for a heavier infill material and a better lifetime performance. So the GeoWeb system is produced using high quality virgin density, high density polyethylene, HDPE. Um, and so this provides consistently strong welds at every cell junction. And it also maintains semi-rigid ductile properties within the cell walls. So if you have too stiff of cell walls, that can lead to overstressing of the seams and the potential for cell rupture, which is a failure of your project site. Um, and so our geocells don't use uh, anything like fillers or exotic polymer alloy blends, um, which ultimately reduce that weld strength um, and the environmental stress crack resistance. Um, so there are sometimes um, competing geocells that offer these specific things, you know, fillers or alloy blends um, in the name of increasing the cell wall stiffness, um, but to the detriment and to the sacrifice of your, your welds and your seams. Um, so it, to avoid that type of failure, um, uniformity in the performance across all elements of a geocell system are much more important than emphasizing a single property such as stiffness alone. Um, so that's getting a bit technical, um, and we'd love to discuss that more with you if you do have questions about it. Um, it's not super, super important that you remember everything I just said, um, but it is just sort of something for you to keep in mind that um, you know we are the originators of the geocell technology. We've been doing research and case studies for 40 years, um, and you know we have one of the most consistent products out there on the market. Okay, so um, the flexible GeoWeb system also offers a choice between that vegetated or a stone surface. Um, you could also do concrete as the infill, um, but then you have an impervious surface, and that's not really why we're here today. Um, if you are curious about this choice, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help. Um, we have lots of information about uh, having that as your concrete as your infill material, um, but just not what we're talking about today. Um, so an important benefit of the GeoWeb system is that you can actually use things like sand or salvaged materials on site. Um, so if you have um, things like recycled concrete or recycled asphalt, you can use those as your infill material. Um, and so that means you can save you know, a significant amount of money on material and hauling costs if you're able to reuse those materials. Um, and so with the confinement within the geo cell, within the geo web cell walls, um, you can actually uh, reduce or eliminate your fines 
of your cohesionless materials. So you don't need a lot of um, you know, small particles within your aggregate so that you can allow for significantly improved drainage and allowing for that water to flow freely through the system um, so that you don't have that pore pressure building up. So really it is considered a truly porous pavement um, you know, without having that choker or that bedding course at the top. Um, and so this is just a little thing that we like to point out is that we do have a specification that we provide um, for all of our uh, geocell and um, rigid, ge rigid porous pavements. Um, just something that we show that says, you know, we stand behind our numbers. We've done the testing. We have, um, you know, all of the, the case studies, all of the projects in the ground right now so that you know that you're building with materials that you can trust. You know, this isn't something that we just sort of threw together in a day and say, here you go, it works. You know, we stand behind our numbers um, so that, you know, you can be certain that this is going to be the right solution for your project. Um, and, you know, we, we're not going to just, uh, you know, sell you something and leave you hanging. We, we trust what we're going to provide for you. Um, so and it's easy to be skeptical of a flexible material claiming to support heavy vehicle loads. Um, so here's a comparison of two areas in the same container yard. Um, and so this was a single pass of a 40 kilonewton wheel load that's going to be equivalent to the Ashto H20 loading. So basically your fully loaded fire truck, a full semi, um, concrete trucks, anything along those lines is going to fit into that category. Um, and you can see how without the GeoWeb system on the right, uh, you know, you've got these deep ruts. You're going to have to go back, constantly be repairing this to get uh, vehicles through. And then with the GeoWeb system on the left, um, you know, it's still a pretty clean surface. You don't have to constantly go back and fix things. Um, you know, it's only going to get worse over time without the GeoWeb system. Um, so, you know, yes, the system really does work. It really can support very heavy loads. Um, and, you know, like I said, we, we have done the research, we trust this material. Um, you know, we're not, not selling snake oil here. Okay, so with all of that, we've talked about both rigid and porous, flexible porous pavements. Um, and now we wanna say, what would be the benefit to choosing a porous pavement over a hard surface. You know, it is something that you have to choose at some point in your design process. Um, and there are some real good benefits to doing that. Um, so all of our products offer a significant amount of storage of stormwater in the cross section as it moves into the groundwater system. And because the water is infiltrated through the system, there's gonna be minimal sheet runoff at the surface. So that's gonna reduce flooding potential on and around your pavement. So the aggregate surface pavements, like the geopave rigid aggregate surface, um, they use that highly permeable open graded aggregate infill. So you have a lot of infiltration of that stormwater. And then if you were to do the vegetated surface, that grass surface, like the geo block rigid paver, um, this keeps the topsoil loose and protected from compaction. Um, so you're not getting, you know, that compacted topsoil over time, which would reduce the amount of water infiltration. It's going to be nice and loose. Water's going to be able to flow through it quickly, uh, much faster than a typical vegetated area. Uh, and so some of the other types of products that are out there, um, you know, those hard surface porous pavements, you know, porous concrete, porous asphalt. Um, and there are some that are based on using geotextiles. So those are gonna percolate much more slowly. Um, so you are gonna still have water ponding at the surface. You're still gonna have that runoff potential um, that you have to take care of. Not so if you use any of our products. Um, then you can also uh, potentially um, reduce the amount of stormwater containment that is needed on your site. And that's because the water is flowing through the system um, and it's being stored in the base underground. Um, and so you might be able to either significantly reduce the size or potentially even eliminate the need for something like a detention pond. Um, so the rate of infiltration um, of your uh, base soil is gonna you know, have an effect on how much uh, you know, that infiltration is gonna be long-term. 
sand is going to allow for more infiltration than a clay would, that sort of thing. Um, but this is something that we can help you determine if you know how much storm water you need to store at any given time, we can help you determine what a, a suitable cross section and product might be uh, that you can work with. Um, so our vegetated geoblock and aggregate geopave units, so those are going to be our rigid pavers, um, they do have a really high crush strength um, because of their rigid nature. And so that's really important because, like I said earlier, you're actually driving on the paver units here. You're not driving on the infill material. So it's really important that the paver units are strong and can support um, those anticipated vehicle loads. Um, and by using our systems, you can actually reduce your potential cross section by you know two to three times, which is significant. Um, and the surface of those porous pavements are going to resist concentrated rutting uh, because the, the loads are dispersed across the whole rigid paver unit. So no wheel ruts, no sunken dry lanes. You're not going to get those standard failure points. Um, and the, the units are strong enough to drive on unfilled. So you don't actually need to have them fully filled in before you start using them. So a little bit faster for installation. Um, and if a thin cross-section is going to be important, these are going to be the way to go. These are going to give you that thinnest possible cross-section while still allowing for the most amount of water infiltration. Um, and so one of the best functions of a porous pavement is to reduce the stress that's transferred to the soil by vehicle traffic. So this is really important when you have vegetation or tree roots that you need to protect. Um, so this was a hotel in southern Illinois. Um, so you can see they had quite a few old growth trees um, that they didn't want to have to remove to put in this new driveway. Um, so they were able to use the geo pave systems. So that's our obviously our aggregate uh, surface. So this is one of the rigid ones, um, but they were able to uh, place the high excuse me the driveway very close to the trees and over the tree root balls. Um, without damaging them and without allowing the high loads of vehicle traffic to cause stress and damage to those tree roots over time. Uh, so this is a great way if you want to try and work with your existing landscape. Um, this way you have that water infiltration right through the surface. Um, so your plants and your trees are still getting all of the water that they need from storm events, but you're protecting them from the high stress of repeated vehicle loads. Um, and so again, with our rigid systems, so the geo block and geo uh, pave systems, uh, they're really uh, highly resistant to movement or breakage from vehicle turning stresses or those torsional loads. So as you're moving your tires back and forth. Um, so they're not actually just straight drive lanes. They are full service vehicle areas allowing for starting, stopping, turning, everything in between. Um, so the panels aren't going to be damaged from any normal vehicle activities, even from the heaviest trucks or semis. Um, the flexible GeoWeb system um, actually also helps hold all of that material in place, all of that uh, stone infill, um, so that the tires don't displace uh, the stone as they're moving across, so everything sort of stays where it's supposed to. Um, and so this was a uh, parking lot at the Citadel in South Carolina. And so it used the GeoPave aggregate system uh, to great effect along a coastline. So that's another, that's a protected uh, water area. So you have to follow a lot of uh, pretty stringent regulations in that type of area where you can't really impede the infiltration capacity of the surrounding soils. Um, you can't, you know, collect and store, you know, have storm water runoff. Um, along the coastline that could be damaging to the environment. So porous pavement was a great choice in this area. Um, the, uh, both the rigid and the flexible pavers actually align really well if you have existing pavements, um, either asphalts, uh, concrete, sort of any traditional pavement. Um, so this was a car dealership. Uh, it was a parking lot addition in Brooklyn, New York. Um, so the paver units do come in rectangles, but they're really easy to field cut, to handle curves, to go around existing structures such as manholes and any other obstacles that are common on site. 
Um, so uh, the aggregate geopave, the vegetated geo block, or the flexible geo web panels um, can all be placed here and they can actually work in concert with your hard surface. Um, and they are actually porous enough that you can handle the runoff from that hard surface pavement without needing to have like a detention swale, anything like that. So this is a great way to add on additional parking spaces while still meeting stormwater requirements at your site, um, especially if you're limited in the amount of hard surface pavement you're allowed to have on site. Um, so the cell walls of the GeoPave aggregate uh, unit are intended to be visible. So they were designed with um, a herringbone pattern, so pretty similar to a paver stone aesthetic. Um, and additionally, the infill stone color can be varied to create a sense of separation. Um, so it's useful for walkways, parking lots, road shoulders, that sort of thing. Um, the geoblock vegetated units allow for that full vegetation growth. Um, so you have a natural sort of lawn look. Um, the cell walls are not visible through the grass, um, so you're not seeing that plastic. And then the GeoWeb flexible panels um, are going to be completely covered either by stone or by grass, um, so you're not going to see any plastic material there either, just your info material. Um, so whatever site or whatever look you're going for on your site, um, you can achieve with any of these products. Um, and so uh, the stone picture on the right was actually a wellness retreat in Northern Wisconsin. Um, and they used the GeoPave system to help achieve uh, LEED Silver certification on their site um, due to the stormwater storage used in the system. And then on the left, uh, this was an office building in Florida that used the GeoBlock vegetated system them as a fire access lane. Uh, so it still looked like a normal lawn, but it could actually support um, fully loaded fire trucks uh, coming uh, to be able to support the, the office building as needed. And you can reduce the site's overall environmental impacts with porous pavements. So you can do this to help meet green infrastructure, low impact development, or green building goals, um, which are pretty important when you're building in protected or densely populated areas. It can also help you meet stormwater requirements that limit the amount of hard surface in your landscaping plans. Um, and that's becoming a lot more common um, in cities and townships. Um, so it's definitely something to make sure that you're on top of and you know how much hard surface you're allowed and how you're able to increase your parking area needs with porous pavements. Um, and so there's a number of constructability benefits for porous pavements as well. Um, all of the product units are lightweight enough for a single person to carry um, and the connectors are really fast to install. Um, and so a great thing that I've mentioned before about the rigid paver units, the GeoBlock and GeoPave, um, is that uh, you can actually use either tracked or rubber tired equipment and you can drive on them when they're not filled. So you can see that in these photos here. Um, so it helps uh, with installation, make it go a lot faster and easier. And specialized paving crews or paving equipment aren't necessary. Um, so you don't need anything special. Oftentimes, you know, your standard landscaping crew is all that's going to be required to install a system like this. So you can save on equipment and labor costs and get these systems in the ground quickly without waiting for cure times or sequenced construction limits. And all of our porous pavement systems are really quite low maintenance. Um, so you don't need to be going back and constantly vacuuming or unclogging, and there's no need to constantly be replacing the stone surface. Um, you know, there's no raveling or anything you have to worry about. Um, and so by having the paver units or the flexible GeoWeb panels locked together and, you know, using basic anchorage methods, such as using stakes, um, you can basically just place it and forget it. So you can also customize your system uh, to help with things like maintenance. Um, you can keep people driving where they're supposed to be. We have some bright yellow or bright blue delineators available. Um, this helps you create parking lines or other markings on site um, so that you can make the space you know, work for you and have it sort of be your own. And then other common extras such as parking stops are really easy to install. Uh, and so this was a porous pavement parking lot down in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, that they were able to use the delineators, they put some parking stops in, um, you know, really made the system what they needed it to be. 
Um, and all three of our options, both rigid and flexible, are capable of supporting those really heavy vehicle loads. I've said it a couple of times, those emergency access vehicles, such as fully loaded fire trucks, um, they go up to Ashto H20 loading in the US, if you're familiar with that. Um, and so these all work really well for emergency access lanes. And so this was Newman University in Wichita, Kansas. Um, so the center median between these existing sidewalks uh, was actually reinforced using the geoblock vegetated system. Um, so it allowed for that vehicle access as needed and otherwise just looked like a regular lawn that people could walk on. And being able to use these systems, even in these really critical areas, shows how the need for extra reinforcement, um, excuse me, being able to use these in these critical areas that need that extra reinforcement shows how well uh, the porous pavement systems can hold up over time while still performing in that really important porous pavement aspect of what you're working on. Okay, so let's move on to some case studies. Let's show how these systems actually work in the real world. Um, so let's start with the flexible GeoWeb system. Um, so this was going to be a walking trail built through the Nahant March Marsh in Iowa. So this was um, through basically a wetland area. Um, so this was actually a community project uh, where uh, uh, volunteers came together to create this walking trail through this really marshy area. Um, they did everything themselves, uh, which actually shows how easy it is to install the system, even when you are, you know, a specialty contractor. You don't do this every day. Um, it's really uh, quite straightforward, um, you know, nothing too complicated. And so because this was a marsh area, not interrupting the water flow was critical. Um, so rainwater can easily flow vertically through the system, but also those marshy wetland uh, areas can have water flow horizontally through the panels because it's actually perforated on all of the panel strips. So you don't have any interruption of water flow really in any of the directions. And the GeoWeb panels were filled in with stone, again, to allow that water flow uh, through the surface and then into the marsh without creating areas of runoff or any areas of non-infiltration like an asphalt road would have, had, would have done. Um, so this way, the impact of the trail on the natural environment is really minimized and the people still get a clean, stable area uh, for use of recreation. Um, so with the flexible system, you can't drive on the panels unfilled without damaging on damaging them, but you can get um, right on them as soon as they're filled, even if you haven't placed the whole area yet. So there's still um, you know that ability to drive on the system when it's not completely ready to help ease that installation process. Um, and so you can either use machinery or good old manual labor. Uh, to fill the GeoWeb cells. Um, and it'll be the same with the rigid GeoPave and GeoBlock first uh, pavements as well. We'll see that in a second. Um, but basically, you can just dump the stone uh, in place off your front end loader and then hand rake it so that all of the cells are filled. Um, and so the overall depth of the cross section um, for the GeoWeb system is pretty variable um, and because those panels come in so many sizes, like I mentioned back at the beginning. Um, and so what that depth of that cross section is, is going to depend on the loading requirements, that sort of thing. And that's something that uh, you know, we can help you with, determine what is gonna be appropriate for your site, uh, anything like that. Something to keep in mind is that the GWeb system usually requires the most excavation of any of our products. Um, so just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about which product might be right for your site. If you're trying to avoid a lot of that excavation, you might want to go with one of the rigid systems. Okay, so speaking of rigid, we're going to switch over to the GeoPave aggregate system. Um, so um, this is going to be sort of what the typical cross section would look like for the GeoPave system. Uh, the GeoPave panels are two inches in depth. Um, and then they may or may not require a base layer of aggregate underneath them. Um, and that's gonna depend on your subgrade strength and then also what your loading requirements are. Um, and sometimes a geotextile might be required, um, but not always necessary. 
And the important thing to note is that there is no choker or bedding course. Everything is made up of that open graded aggregate, something that's gonna allow the most water infiltration through the system. You're not gonna have anywhere that's gonna sort of limit that infiltration capacity. Um, so the biggest factor in determining uh, whether or not you need a base and what that base depth might be is going to be your soil strength. Uh, and this is usually expressed as the California bearing ratio, CBR, of your soil. So the higher the ratio, the stronger your soil. Um, but the strength of the geopave uh, units themselves is that even for that highest load rating, so ASHTO H25, uh, so that's going to be your fully loaded fire trucks, um, is that there's really a relatively uh, low base depth requirement. Um, so it's only six inches total um, of base. So you get an eight inch cross section, six inches of base plus two inches of geopave unit. Um, and this is compared to things like 14 inches of um, you know, a total cross section if you uh, were to have unreinforced stone or usually it's an eight to 10 inch base layer underneath a three to four inch porous asphalt or porous concrete surface. So it is gonna be a thinner cross section um, even under those very high loads. Um, so there are a wide variety of uses for the geopave aggregate system. Um, things like uh, fire and utility lanes, site access roads, um, adding road shoulders for uh, runoff reduction, and then walking trails or sidewalks um, are also options. And the geopave system is going to be ADA compliance when uh, it's filled with an open graded stone. So this means it's usable for wheelchairs, uh, walkers, crutches, particularly high heels, um, anything like that. So once the panels are filled with that stone, they are considered fully ADA compliant. Um, and then, so this is just sort of a what could go wrong. And this is with one of the competitor products out on site. Um, when you're Panels don't have those strong sort of shared connections. Um, they're actually going to uh, lead to a lot of problems like you see in the inset photo where the panels have just ripped apart underneath those torsional loads. So whenever you have a car just trying to turn its tire, um, when it's not a strong connection between all of those little circles, they're just gonna rip apart and then you don't have any support anymore. Um, and then one of the big things I mentioned with the geopave system was that mesh bottom where it was already integrated into the paver unit. And I said that, that was to help keep the stone uh, within the unit and not to migrate below. That's because if you do lose that stone underneath the unit, like you see in the main photo here, it actually creates like humps. It, the stone gets under there, the cells are now unfilled. You can see all those empty circles. And again, you're losing your support. Now you have a big hump in the middle of your road um, and it's all not doing what it needs to. So there are definitely things that can go wrong. And this just sort of shows why we designed the geopave system the way that we did. Uh, so let's do another case study, shall we? Um, so this was in Antioch Pike, which is in Tennessee. Um, and so this was a cell phone tower area. It was located on a hill. Um, and they did this specifically so that there could be stormwater runoff. Um, so the project was built in 2013, um, and it did require a porous pavement system to manage that stormwater on site um, because they were getting erosion outside of this uh, cell tower pad um, because the water was running off of the asphalt road and then causing erosion issues. Um, and so the construction area was quite limited, so there was no area for like a detention pond or a swale or anything. So they needed the porous pavements uh, to help with that. Uh, so because this project was primarily about stormwater retention, they actually decided to use a really deep cross section. They went for nine inches of stone uh, underneath the geopave unit. And this was so that it could hold the maximum amount of water. Um, generally, we say that uh, the stone can hold about a third of its depth. So in this case, nine inches of stone allowed for three inches of immediate stormwater storage. So that's during your storm event and then allowing it to percolate through. Um, so 
that's just sort of the rule of thumb. And that's something we can talk about more if you do have specific questions about how much storage you could achieve using one of these products. Um, and so uh, the GeoPave units have specialty connectors. They're called U-clip connectors. Um, you can see them here. Um, basically, they're, they're really easy to basically hammer in place, but they connect all of the different panels together in a good, strong connection so you don't lose the stone underneath, which we just saw was a bad thing. Um, and then you can see a small uh, excavator was able to push stone in place. The bobcat was able to, to work on them. Um, so really small equipment's needed. You don't need a lot of big, high-end equipment. Um, and then, so here was the tower uh, after construction. Um, so because of the stormwater retention in the base, um, they didn't need to use a uh, detention pond. Um, so this was great for areas like this where you don't have the room to spare. Um, so this was what it looked like immediately after uh, construction. Um, and then this is a picture that was taken about three years later. Um, so it still looks really good. Uh, it was both the power pad and then the access road to that pad. Um, so very little maintenance required for this area. Um, some recommended tips that we do have for the geopave pavement is basically to keep the lot clear of organics. So things like um, fallen leaves, especially in the fall, um, you don't want those decomposing over the top of the system because that actually uh, prevents that water infiltration. So uh, you can rake those leaves off, leaf blower, anything like that is going to be good to go. Um, and then in snowy areas, you can actually still plow. Um, you just want to either use a rubber plow boot or keep the plow blade a little bit above the system so that you don't have any accidental interaction between the plow blade and the geopave units. Um, I do know that placing porous pavements in cold weather and snowy conditions is a concern for owners and regulators. So we actually have a lot of information available on our website answering some of our uh, most commonly seen questions or feel free to contact us directly and we're more than happy to help alleviate those concerns. Okay, so now we're gonna switch uh, one last time to the geoblock vegetated system. Um, so here's our typical cross section again. Um, there's actually two options with the vegetated system. You can either have um, a 1.2 inch or a two inch depth. So there's basically just two different depth options. Um, and you would choose one or the other based on the loading requirements. The thinner option is better for things like walking trails or really light vehicles, um, things like regular standard cars and pickup trucks. And then if you did need that, um, you know, Astro H20 emergency vehicle, you'd want to go with the thicker cross section. Um, and something that we like to point out is um, the units themselves are fully filled in with topsoil. Um, so it's really good for growing your grass. You don't have to use sand or anything like that. Um, and then if you do need a base underneath the unit, so if it's not going to be directly touching uh, your natural ground to grow into, um, you can use what we call engineered base, which is a mixture of aggregate and topsoil. Um, to support your vehicle loads while still allowing for that grass growth. Um, so again, pretty similar uses for the geoblock grass paver. Again, you can do fire uh, and emergency access lines, um, but it's also great for things like special event parking or overflow parking. Um, and remember with the grass surface, it can't be used every day. So that's why I think, um, you know, two to three times a week at max. So uh, things like church parking, you're really only at a church one or two times a week, so it's not going to kill the grass, you're not driving on it too much, but it does provide that great parking area. Um, and so again, that same uh, potential for uh, a base layer, depending on the strength of your soil as CBR and your vehicle loads, um, again, you can have pretty thin cross sections as needed. Um, so we can help you determine what is going to be the most appropriate for your site based on your specific project conditions. Um, and again, there are uh, some other, uh, you know, not so great systems out there. And one of the biggest things is um, with the geoblock system, you're, because you're driving on that rigid uh, paver unit, you can use just pure topsoil as your infill, which allows for that grass growth. 
Um, other systems, you're actually driving on the infill, so you need sand, which is going to be a bit stronger than topsoil, but you know, you're not going to grow a great lawn in sand. Um, so again, there are just um, there are other options out there, and I want to let you know, you know, there are problems with them and why we designed the GeoBlock system the way we did. Um, and then two quick case studies here. Um, the first was for actually a residential house. Um, so they were experiencing some septic issues in their septic field. Um, and so their septic yard needed to be replaced. Um, and the owner also wanted to have additional parking spaces, um, but they'd run out of room for their traditional driveway without infringing on their septic field. So they decided to use the geoblock system, uh, to sort of kill two birds with one stone uh, style. Um, so again, the owner decided to do everything themselves. Um, and so that's going to be absolutely possible uh, with our rigid systems. The installation process is really simple and straightforward. Um, so the geoblock panels were laid directly on the subgrade. No base layer was required for this uh, specific project. Um, and then the geoblock panels were filled in with soil um, and uh, they were able to uh, lay the panels out so that there wouldn't be any issues with the septic field, any sort of irrigation they might have needed, anything like that. Um, and then they chose to hydro seed uh, rather than just wait for seeded topsoil to grow. Um, that was their personal choice. Um, you can do either one. Hydro seeding is a great option to get that loan growing uh, quite quickly. Um, there's really no requirement for the type of grass that's used within one of these systems. You really just want something that's going to be the best for your local climate. So what grows well in New Hampshire at this site is not going to grow as well in Arizona. So just something to keep in mind, whatever is most appropriate for your area is going to work for this porous pavement system. Um, and then here we are a couple weeks after construction. The grass has fully grown in. You can see it's a beautiful green lawn. They're able to lawn mow it. Um, it is still functions as their septic field, uh, and they're able to still park uh, some cars and trucks over it. So winds all around. Um, and like I said, they were able to lawn mow it. You can see the, the lawn mower tracks here. So that's really the only maintenance requirements. Um, and this is going to be a standard lawn mower. You don't need any sort of specialty uh, landscaping lawn mower to do this. Um, you know, you're not going to interfere with the panels with that lawn mower. Um, so that'll do the trick. And then a last case study. Um, this is with the Natapawasi Huron Band of the Potawatomi Tribe. Um, this was done up in Michigan. Um, and so they were looking for a parking area for trailers. Um, and this was a very soft clay ground um, that was uh, constantly you know, getting wet and really mucky. It was bogging down the trailers, that sort of thing. Um, but because this was a protected wilderness area, um, they weren't able to do an asphalt parking lot, so they were, had to go with a porous pavement. Um, so everything was installed in October of 2019, um, and it was done before the snows came in. Uh, so the ground was leveled off, the geoblock panels were placed, um, again, directly on the ground. Um, so they were laid in a herringbone pattern. Um, so this is recommended when there's going to be that bi-directional traffic, so lots of turning and movement and moving your trailers around, lots of parking, that sort of thing. Um, and so they didn't have to do a lot of uh, excavation, which is good because, again, it's that wilderness area. They needed to try and minimize uh, the impact to the surrounding environment. Um, and then they were able to fill it all in with dirt. And you can actually drive on it right now, even though the grass isn't there. Again, you're driving on the actual units themselves. Um, so they're able to use this parking area right away. Um, and then uh, this was summer of 2021, so two years after installation. Um, so again, you're not going to see those panels. It just looks like a beautiful green lawn. Um, it's now safe for cars and trailers, but it's also easy to walk on. You can play on it. Um, you know, with that full grass growth, that lawn is maintained again with that standard lawnmower. Um, so again, it's a, a great solution for uh, this sort of area where there was, it had to be you know, minimal environmental impact. Okay, so um, the engineering team here at Presto, um, including myself, uh, we work closely with landscape designers, engineers, contractors, pretty much anybody who's running a project 
Um, and we offer a free project design evaluation service for a porous pavement project that you might have. So we analyze your site-specific data, including um, you know, your loading requirements, what your native soil is, what your local regulations are, that sort of thing. And we're gonna offer a recommendation for a product and a cross-section that's gonna meet your project needs. Um, so just a quick summary, uh, we covered both rigid and flexible porous pavement systems with the geopave aggregate surface, the geoblock vegetated surface, and the geoweb flexible porous pavement. Um, so three really similar names, but they all have different functions. Um, and so we went over how they handle uh, you know, multiple uses, high vehicle loadings, um, you, they have all that high infiltration rate to reduce your runoff, um, all that good stuff. Um, so a lot of stuff we covered today. I know it was all a lot, so hopefully you were able to, uh, to make sense of it all. Um, and again, just our specification, you know, we do deliver quality and we have 40 plus years of experience and expertise. Um, so we really do guarantee each of our shipments is going to meet or exceed our specifications so that you can deliver certainty and build with materials that you're going to trust. Um, you know, we have no disclaimers, no concerning fine prints, anything like that. Um, and that is my presentation. Um, so thank you so much for attending. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to either reach out directly to myself, my contact info is on screen, or you can go to our website at prestogeo.com. We've got a lot of information on there. You might be able to find the answer to your question, or there's uh, a whole contact page on there that you can use to get a hold of us. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we are making it easier and faster for you to obtain your PDH certificate uh, because you do get a PDH certificate for listening to me today. Um, so with our webinar dashboard, you can easily view our library of webinars and download your PDH certificates for any of the on-demand webinars that you've completed. Um, your webinar dashboard is going to complete a or keep a record of your completed on-demand webinars along with your PDHs. So in two to three days, you're going to receive an email from Presto Geosystems. And that's gonna give you information about accessing the webinar dashboard and some other helpful resources. So by the end of the week, look for an email from Presto Geosystems. Um, if you attended live today, uh, thank you for coming, um, but you are going to automatically receive a PDA certificate from GoToWebinar. Um, so please keep in mind, this is not from Presto Geosystems. It's going to be from GoToWebinar, um, and it's going to have a link for you to download your certificate. Um, so maybe check your spam folder if you don't see it within 24 hours. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping there. Um, I have gone pretty much to the end of my hour, um, but there are lots of questions that I want to get to. Um, so I'm going to stay on and answer um, as many questions as I can in the next couple of minutes. If you do need to get off, I fully understand. Thank you for attending. Uh, but I am going to keep recording. So all of these questions and answers are going to be on the end of the recording. So if you do want to listen to the question and answer session um, in that couple of days when you get the information about the webinar dashboard, feel free to go on there, re-listen to this webinar, and then skip to the end where the Q&A session is, and you can uh, get everything we talked about today. Um, so I'm going to uh, just talk or go through a couple of these questions because we had some good ones. Um, and so uh, one of the first ones was, um, how do they deal with um, the exposed section? So really specifically, that's going to be the geopave aggregate unit. But how do they deal with being exposed in the environment, especially uh, to things like UV conditions, um, that sort of thing? Um, and so the answer is uh, they actually hold up really well. Um, so all of our products have an additive to them called carbon black. Um, so this is a very small percentage of the resin material, but it actually is a UV protectant for the high density polyethylene. And so this means it's not going to uh, break down or start you know, decomposing or anything due to uh, UV exposure. So it can, you know, sit out and be exposed to sunlight every day for, you know, the next 50 years, and it's not going to have um, any sort of detrimental effects to it. Um, we have uh, 
GeoWeb and GeoPave uh, systems out there where they are exposed uh, to sunlight. Um, and they've been out for about 40 years. Um, that's how long uh, we've been in business and these sort of technologies have been available, it's about 40 years. Um, and they're still looking, you know, basically as good as the day they were put in. It's still, you know, a solid, um, you know, piece of high density polyethylene, same as it was, you know, when it was manufactured. Um, you're not going to see like bleaching of the color or anything. It's still going to be um, that strong black color of the plastic, um, and you're not going to have any of that degradation. It's not going to become brittle or crack due to that sunlight exposure or that you know, environmental exposure, anything like that. Um, so they're actually still in really good condition um, and you don't have to worry about uh, environmental breakdown of any of our products. So great question. Um, let's see, uh, a couple questions about um, accessibility, uh, especially ADA, that sort of thing. Um, and so yes, all of our products are considered ADA accessible once they've been filled in with their infill material. So whether it's that stone or the topsoil and the grass, um, once they're filled in, they are considered ADA accessible. Um, so you can use those on any of your sites. They can be your walkways, they can be you know your parking lots, anything like that. Um, and you're not going to have, excuse me, any issues with you know wheelchair users or uh, you know uneven walking surfaces, anything like that. Uh, so that is definitely something that you can sort of check off your list of, yes, these are ADA accessible, um, you know, for uh, any and all patrons who might be using this area. So great question. Um, let's see, there are some questions um, about using these on a slope. Um, so using some of our products on a slope. Um, so one of the case studies, the GeoPave one, um, the cell phone tower was actually on a slope, but all three of the products can be used on slopes or graded conditions. They don't have to be on perfectly flat, smooth areas. Um, so a couple things to think about when you are on a slope um, is uh, sort of first, you have to make sure that it is a grade that is drivable. Um, so you're not putting these on a one-to-one -one slope you're not driving any sort of vehicle on that. Um, so generally we try and say um, a two to one slope, which is gonna be around 25 degrees, is gonna be the maximum allowable. And that's because that's really the maximum allowable that most vehicles are capable of driving on. Um, when you do have steeper slopes, you are gonna have to consider anchoring the systems in place. Um, and that's something that we can help you determine. We do have, um, specific anchoring methods uh, for all of the different products, um, either with uh, stakes to hold them in place or for very steep slopes, uh, you might need to use um, you know, a, a tendon and a crest anchorage type of system. Um, these are all very project dependent. There is no one uh, right answer I can give you, but we are happy to uh, talk about them with you and we have um, you know, our methods of determining what is going to be the appropriate anchorage method for a specific cross-section, a specific project, um, that if you were to go for one of our uh, free project evaluations, we would provide that information in our recommended cross-section, uh, and that would have um, supporting calculations showing, you know, the how and the why that anchorage rec recommendation was made, um, and we would also provide um, things like CAD details that could show you how that anchorage is uh, supposed to be placed um, that you could insert into your plan sets. Um, so those are some, just some of the things that we could offer with our pre-project design evaluation. Um, but yeah, you can definitely go on slopes. Um, you know, very rarely is the ground you know, perfectly flat for us all. So those sort of variable site conditions are definitely something that we can work with. Um, some other questions. Um, let's see, uh, what, under what conditions would a geotextile be recommended? So that's a great question. So um, a geotextile underneath a porous pavement really has to be um, necessary to be placed because you really don't want anything to impede that water flow. And a geotextile is not going to do too much, but it is going to be a potential uh, impediment to that water flow. So in general, we try and avoid those geotextiles when we can, 
but if necessary, they do need to be placed. Um, and probably one of the biggest reasons you would use a geotextile is when you have very different soil conditions to what you're putting into your porous pavement. So if you do have a very mucky, wet, clay soil, like if you're in a wetland area and then you have just that really horrible marshy soil, you're gonna want a geotextile underneath the porous pavement to help hold that stone in place. Um, and so that's just so that, you know, your stone doesn't get sort of lost into that marshy soil. Um, and so that's really something that you would need for the GeoWeb system, that flexible panel. If you were to use the GeoPave system, the rigid one, already has that mesh bottom in place. Um, so that's going to help prevent that loss of stone. So you might not need a geotextile there. So there's a number of different factors as to why you would need one or not. Um, and that's something that we would provide in our recommendation for you um, as to what geotextile and why it is necessary. Um, looks like I have time for one last question. I am going quite over. Um, but it was about um, the, uh, uh, the, the wheel load capacity for your, uh, so, uh, excuse me, your vegetated surfaces. Um, and so that's just sort of a thing with sometimes with vegetation, you tend to, and a grass surface, you tend to think it can't support as heavy a load. And that's normally true if you don't have a, a specific forest pavement, uh, you know, just a standard topsoil area, just a lawn really can't usually support very heavy loads. Um, but with one of our porous pavement systems, the vegetated surfaces can support all the way up to that ASHTO H20 loading. So that's gonna be you know, your fire trucks, emergency vehicles, construction equipment, pretty much anything that's allowed on a highway would be allowed on here. Um, so even though you do have that topsoil, which is you know, not really capable of supporting the load, the porous pavement unit itself, either the geo block vegetated system, which is the rigid one, or the geo web system, which is the flexible one filled in with soil, uh, that would be uh, able to support those very heavy uh, vehicle loads. So I've gone quite over my time. Thank you everyone who was able to stay on and uh, listen to some of these question and answers. If I didn't get to yours, or if you think of one later, please feel free to uh, reach out to me directly or through our website. We are more than happy to answer any questions or discuss uh, any specific projects you might be thinking of using a porous pavement on. Um, and with that, I hope you all have a wonderful day uh, and that we see you at in uh, future webinars uh, coming up throughout the year. So uh, thanks everyone, bye.